Hello, my name is Vinit Chopra. I am the chief of the division of hospital medicine at Michigan Medicine. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about acute gastrointestinal bleeding. My talk comes from our new book, The Saint Chopra Guide to Inpatient Medicine. Uh, this was written by my colleague Sanjay Saint and myself and really is a guide to thinking about how you approach the care of hospitalized medical patients. So acute GI bleeding is both common and serious. And we classify it based upon its location in terms of where the bleed is coming from. So we say upper GI bleeds are those that occur proximal to the ligament of trites, whereas lower GI bleeds are ones that occur distal to that. And we call GI bleeds different things depending on certain definitions. So we often will call a GI bleed hematemesis. And when we say this, what we mean is that we're seeing blood, including coffee grounds in the vomitus. Coffee ground emesis is almost always upper GI bleeding, and it occurs because blood is being digested by acid in the stomach. So the coffee grounds are actually hemoglobin being converted to hematin. So it has a very dark and odorous smell. Hematochesia, on the other hand, is red or maroon colored blood in the stool. Almost always this is lower GI bleeding, but in 10% of cases, this can be an upper GI bleed. And the thing to remember in those 10% of patients is that indicates that the bleeding is happening so rapidly that blood is transiting through the actual GI tract without changing color. So in many ways, this is a life-threatening emergency. And finally, melana. Melana almost always indicates the presence of black tarry stool. And what that means is it's blood coming in from the upper GI tract having been digested by acid, hematin. Melana almost always means upper GI bleeding. And the key thing about melana is it often smells horrible. So when you enter a patient's room, you can actually smell this from the distance and it should be your first clue that a patient may have an upper GI bleed. The most common causes of upper GI bleeding are difficult to remember, but in the St. Chopra guide, we focus a lot on memory tricks, including mnemonics. And the mnemonic I want you to remember for an upper GI bleed are gum bleeding. Now the words gum, the first word, G-U-M, has the most common causes, and here they are. So the G stands for gastritis, and this essentially means any inflammation of the stomach lining. Commonly, we'll see this in the setting of a peptic ulcer disease or stress gastritis, but it is a nonspecific finding and on endoscopy, which indicates just irritation of the stomach wall. U is ulcers, and ulcers are a common cause of GI bleeding, especially when they erode through a blood vessel. When you think of ulcers as a source of GI bleeding, always think about cancer, and always think about testing for Helicobacter pylori, because treatment and eradication of H. pylori is key to healing of the ulcers. The M is a Mallory Weiss tear, and this is a tear that occurs in the esophagus in a setting of prolonged and forced vomiting. Essentially, the, the increase in intra-abdominal pressure forces tearing of the esophageal wall. And so it's typically preceded by a history of vomiting for several days or hours that is forceful and typically associated with retching. B is biliary causes of bleeding. And yes, bile can cause a GI bleed. Bile typically will reflux back into the stomach, especially in situations where the distal valve of the stomach is incompetent because you've had surgery there or because you have some type of achalasia or some type of motility problem in the stomach wall. And so when bile refluxes back, you get an alkaline gastritis. And just like a regular gastritis, that can cause erosion of the stomach wall and bleeding as well. The L is really important, but not common. Large varices. Large varices can cause life-threatening bleeding, and these are an important source of upper GI bleeding, especially in patients who have had a history of this before or who have a history of liver disease. You should always be thinking about a variceal bleed. The E is esophagitis or esophageal ulcers. Again, we see this with reflux and uh, other causes of inflammation in the esophagus. I also want you to remember infectious causes of esophagitis, and the two ones that I think about are often candidial or candida and herpes simplex. And both of those should start make, making you think about immune deficiencies or other causes of superimposed infections in the esophagus. E is an enteroaortic fistula, and the classic tip there is called the herald bleed. So enteroaortic fistulas commonly occur in patients who've had prior aortic surgery. So the classic setup is somebody walks in having had an aortic surgical repair, typically an aortic arch or a wall repair, 
and they have a small amount of GI bleeding and they look stable only to have a large amount of bleeding a few hours later. The small amount of bleeding initially is called the, the herald bleed and that's the one that you will be asked about and you may look for when you're on the wards. The D is duodenitis, uh, which is a common cause of GI bleeding, again, related to peptic ulcer disease or NSAID use. Uh, the Du La Foy lesion is named after a French surgeon, uh, Paul Georges Du La Foy, who first described this. And what this is, is a very large artery or arteriole in the mucosa that erodes through and starts to bleed. Uh, du La Foy is also French for by the grace of God. And so this is a, one of those things where you have to be very careful and you have to be very cautious about treating these patients because they can bleed very quickly. I is inflammatory bowel disease, and you should always think about IBD when you're thinking about GI bleeding, especially Crohn's disease that can affect any part of the GI tract, uh, not so much ulcerative colitis, which can happen more on the lower part of the GI tract, the rectum, and more distal areas. Remember with IBD, you should be thinking about this in specific age groups as well, given the bimodal distribution of some of these diseases. The N is neovascularization, and what this means is the formation of immature or otherwise new blood vessels. The common condition here to think about is aortic stenosis, where you have underlying arterioles and AVMs form, and you can certainly have those rupture and bleed. We call this Hades syndrome, and it's often associated with von Willebrand's factor that is no longer functional because of the aortic stenosis and the stress on the blood vessels. And G, and the last one, is gastric cancer. And this is important to remember, especially in patients who have associated symptoms of either weight loss or a strong family history. When you think about lower GI bleeding, there's a more limited differential diagnosis. And the way to remember this is the following, that you may need a drain to collect the blood coming from the lower GI tract. So the mnemonic here is drain, and let's walk through what this is. The D stands for diverticulosis. And by far and none, this is the most common cause of painless GI bleeding in adults over 65 years of age. Diverticulosis can also be self-limiting, so it can come and go. When you have pain with diverticulosis and maybe a white count and fever, you should start thinking about diverticulitis. R is radiation proctitis, and this is bleeding coming from the lower part of the GI tract, typically in patients who've had radiation for some underlying malignancy. So in men, think colon cancer or genital urinary cancers, and in women, think genital urinary cancers, typically ovarian cancer, where they may have had radiation performed as well. A is arteriovenous malformation. We discussed this with aortic stenosis, typically seen in the lower GI tract. And again, these are painless causes of lower GI bleeding. I is significant for three conditions. So there's ischemia, inflammation, and infection. Ischemia is important to remember in older adults, and the classic picture there is somebody who has an underlying atrial fibrillation or atrial tachyarrhythmia who may have thrown an embolism to the distal bowel or the superior or inferior mesenteric artery, leading to bowel ischemia. Uh, inflammation and infection can happen from a number of reasons, and it's again one of the things to think about when you've got no other clear explanation for lower GI bleeding. And then, and the most important to think about in older patients as well is neoplasm. And so always think about getting a cancer history and a screening history with respect to colonoscopies to understand if this might be a risk. How do you know if someone needs to go to the ICU with a GI bleed? Well, you should ask if they need a visa. Well, what is a visa? The V is variceal bleeding. So as I just discussed, this is one of those key things that gets the gastroenterologist up at night and into the hospital. Patients who have known varices who present with upper GI bleeding can literally exsanguinate in a matter of a few minutes. So it's important that you think about this in an ICU setting. I is any instability of vital signs. Remember, by the time your vital signs start to become unstable, you've already lost a lot of blood volume. And so you should be looking for tachycardia and hypotension in patients who are presenting with symptoms and signs of GI bleeding as an indicator of how much volume of blood they've lost. S includes serious comorbidities. And the reason this is important is when somebody has underlying diabetes or chronic kidney disease or congestive heart failure, any trigger to blood loss can actually exacerbate those underlying conditions and cause multi-system organ damage. So think of an older patient who presents with an upper GI bleed but has chest pain because they have critical coronary artery disease and have lost significant amount of blood.
So serious comorbidities should almost always want you to think about the ICU. And the last one is a active GI bleeding or advanced age. These are also worse prognostic indicators for outcomes with GI bleed. And so if someone's actively bleeding in front of you, think about an ICU bed for that patient. I want to quickly highlight the approach to GI bleeding and how you should think about that if you're on the wards. The first evaluation focuses on resuscitation. So what we would recommend is two large bore intravenous catheters, making sure you have a type and cross, a cardiac monitor, and oxygen. People often ask me whether or not you should place a central line in a unstable GI bleed, and my answer is almost always no. And that's because I want you to remember Poiseuille's law with respect to flow across a catheter. You can get just as much flow across a 16 gauge intravenous catheter in the antecubital fossa as you can in a central line. And so always obtain peripheral access with large bore IVs as the first step. Second, if you're gonna send the patient to the ICU, you should be having them monitored and watched by GI almost immediately. So in my mind, an ICU admission is an automatic gastroenterology consultation. That should not wait for the morning. That should be something that should be seen expeditiously. And again, the key here is not necessarily to have them scope someone quickly, but the key is to have them assess whether or not a scope might be helpful. Because most importantly, you should not delay resuscitation while awaiting a consult. No GI physician is gonna give a patient anesthesia when they're hemodynamically unstable. So the key for you to remember is that we will not advise or recommend diagnostic testing, any kind of diagnostic testing, until the patient is adequately volume resuscitated. And that typically means at least two to four liters of crystalloid infusions, as well as blood products. You wanna make sure the patient is able to tolerate the procedure so that they can have it safely, even if they need it to stop their bleeding. One last tip, remember that a unit of blood entering or leaving the body will drop the hemoglobin by approximately one gram per deciliter. So when you're giving blood back and you're looking for a response, you should be looking for a one gram change upwards. If you don't see that, there may still be ongoing GI bleeding. So thank you for your attention. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, this is just a small sample of what you'll find in the St. Chopra Guide to Inpatient Medicine. I hope you like it, and if you do, I would certainly recommend you considering buying the book. You can buy it on this link, and please use this code to get 30% off. Thanks very much.